So contrary to popular belief, my name is Felina. <laughs> <laughs> People always mess it up. It's a complicated name. Actually, my name is also my handle on Twitter, so if you want to tweet what you think about my talk, feel free to do so. I'm assistant professor at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, where I research programming, and specifically programming education. So who knew, know, knows who said this? Everyone should learn programming. Who said this? <laughs> Someone is pointing at themselves. That's sort of correct. I think every programmer ever writes. We all love programming, so we all say, yeah, everyone should learn programming because programming is the best and it's so nice and it gets you in the flow. But of course, this, this leads to a very interesting question of what exactly is programming? If we say everyone should know programming, that means we have some sort of conception of what programming is. So what actually is it? And this is an interesting question specifically because we are in the world of programming, quite literally here at this conference. We hang out with other people that like programming. We are programming all the time. And that might not qualify us as the best people to define programming. And this is maybe best illustrated by a joke that I really like about three fishes. So this big fish is swimming, and he's meeting two other tiny fishes. So the big fish says, hey, folks, how's the water? And the tiny fishes say, what's water? They don't know what water is. Imagine being a fish. The only thing you've ever seen in your entire life is water. So for you, water is synonymous to the whole world. You don't know you're in water. You don't know you could potentially be yanked out of the water, and it wouldn't be a very pleasant experience if you were a fish. So, so these tiny fish are, are us. Maybe we're not really good at defining what programming is because we're swimming and programming the whole time. And for me, this is not just an interesting story, but it's actually quite a personal story about how I was feeling about what programming is. Fair warning, I did this talk at another conference, and someone said that Felina is basically doing a therapy session with an audience. This is true. So let me go back to the year 2008, when I moved from Eindhoven, this is the tiny country of the Netherlands, to Delft, which is like 100 kilometers, but for a person from a tiny country, that is a big move. And I went to work at TU Delft, Delft University of Technology, where my supervisor, my PhD supervisor, had set this research question for me. He said, you know what would be really cool if you could write a PhD dissertation about a DSL for finance, a domain-specific language for finance, a programming language specifically made for people in banking and insurance, that type of thing. So we envisioned something like this, a programming language that would be easy enough to understand for non-programmers in which they could explain their domain rules. So I went to do a small internship at a Dutch insurance company. And when I was in school, they told me that the world is more or less this. You have users on the one hand side, and then in the middle there's a big wall, and then you have programmers on the other side. And the users use and the programmers program. I'm not sure if they still teach this in computer science programs, but this is more or less the way they presented the world to me. Programmers make software for users to use. So in this first internship, I found out that it wasn't really like that. Not only the programmers were programming, also the users, let's say the normal people, were programming. But they weren't programming in a traditional textual language. They were programming in spreadsheets. So I went back to my supervisor at the university. I said, hey, friends, they don't need a DSL in finance. They have a DSL in finance, and it's Excel. So I don't imagine anything that I could pr produce in this four-year PhD that would outperform Excel. It's just it's such a good programming language. So the motto of my PhD dissertation became spreadsheets are code, and they're not just code. Spreadsheets are really the best programming language that has ever existed in the history of programming languages. It's such a good programming language that people don't know they're programming. Like, imagine doing Java by accident. <laughs> like, I don't know, I opened my laptop and there was Eclipse. 
And it was so intuitive, I immediately knew what to do. <laughs> no one ever. So it's such a good programming language. People don't, people don't even self-identify as programmers. So it's like walking up to that guy that made a huge risk assessment in a spreadsheet. I was like, oh, that's cool, man. You're like a programmer. He was like, no, 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 no. I'm not a programmer. It's just a model. It's such a powerful programming language. It's very friendly and engaging. But also, technically, it's very interesting. It has all the buzzwords, if you haven't realized. Because spreadsheets are functional programming. A formula in a spreadsheet is pure functional. The only thing a formula in a spreadsheet can do is take input from other formulas and produce a result based upon that. So it's, it's guaranteed to be side effect free. And it's also reactive. If you change the cell, then the cells that depend on that cell are updated and not other cells. So it's a reactive functional language. But also it's used by 750 million people. Eat that, Haskell. It's such a good programming language. So there's also downsides. And what I realized when I was working on my dissertation is spreadsheets need an IDE. Spreadsheets can be really complicated, like traditional source code. Sometimes you have multiple worksheets. We've seen spreadsheets that had like 100 worksheets, all formulas interlinking all the sheets. And at that point, you're in need for some IDE support. You want to have something that analyzes the structure of your spreadsheet and gives you some feedback and maybe helps you to restructure your spreadsheets. Basically, it needs an IDE. One of the things that I've worked on is to define code smells for spreadsheets. So you can imagine a code smell, a traditional code smell, for example, is a long method, a big method with, I don't know, 100 lines. In a similar way that that is smelly code, you can imagine that a long formula is a smelly formula. Or another code smell is a function with lots of parameters. Well, you can imagine that a formula with lots of input is smelly in the same way. So long methods and also duplication code cloning, the same parts of calculation in different parts of a code base or in different parts of a spreadsheet are smelly because they're going to make code harder to maintain. So it's actually quite natural once you look at spreadsheets as means of programming to take all the things we know that work really well from programming, like code smells, to spreadsheets, which is exactly what I did. So I wrote a bunch of papers smells, refactoring tools, clone detection, and testing. And that ended up helping me graduate. So that was my entire thesis was about spreadsheets or code. So this is the story from the brain. This is what actually happened. And I went to lots of programming conferences like this to spread the happy word that spreadsheets are code. But as I said, it's sort of a therapy session. There's also the story from the heart. How was I feeling while I was working on that? And it wasn't necessarily super fun. So this is me, like, super happy at the beginning of my PhD, like, yay, hello, fellow developers, spreadsheets are code. And they're like, yeah, that's not real programming. Now, you're laughing, but it was actually wasn't really that funny, because I did the same sermon, you know, but, you know, they're functional and they're reactive, but they're so inclusive and fun for everyone not real programming. And it went on and on and on. And after a while, it just really drags you down. Because why isn't it real programming? Why do people keep saying that? It is real programming. Come on. And at that point, so this was towards the end of my PhD, I thought this was really the normal way of humans, adults, that like a certain topic to interact with each other. I thought it's, it's totally appropriate if you go to a community event and you say, hey, I'm working on spreadsheet to pe to, for people to say, like, yeah, that's shit. Or to say, oh, I'm a PHP developer, and people say, oh, pff, security vulnerabilities, or whatever. I thought that is the normal way for people to hang out with each other. Fast forward to a little bit later, so now I'm also not just programming, I'm also running. And who's a runner in the audience? A bunch of people. So people that are runners, they like running. They like talking about running. And also, they actively try to convert other people into runners. If you're slow, if you take, I don't know, five hours for a marathon, 
no one in the running community would say, oh, you're so slow. They would say, great, what is your training schedule? And here's tips. We are, you know, the runners, we are so encouraging to everyone. If I see someone running to catch a bus, I'll go next to them. I'm like, hey, I noticed you enjoy running. Do you want to go for a jog together? It's such an inclusive community. It doesn't matter what shoes you wear. No one will say, oh, you're running on Nike shoes? Ugh, that is old-fashioned. It's so inclusive, and it's not just running. I'm also a knitter, and I hadn't knitted for a while, and then I came back to knitting. It also has meetups, like developer events. And I went there with very old-fashioned straight needles. I didn't know they were out of fashion. I just went there with my granny's needles. So everyone's like, oh, you have old needles. Well, we have these new circular needles now, and they're better in this and this and this way. I can show you. I can help you get used to these new needles. No one said, oh, you know, your needles have security vulnerabilities. It's so inclusive, and that really made me reflect back on programming. Like, like, why are we like that? Why do we do this to ourselves and to other people? But that was only later when I realized, hey, not all adult communities are like that. So let's just go back a little bit into 2012. I was really fed up with this topic. I started to be as super engaged, but after a while it was just, I don't want to tell the same story again. I don't know what to do. Luckily, I ran into a bunch of kids in a community center in Rotterdam, where I lived then, and they said, hey, we need a programming teacher. So I was like, I can do that. You know, I really don't know what I want to do in my life. I have to do research because I had accepted a faculty position at the university then, so I needed to do some research, but I was so uninspired by the whole spreadsheet story. I was like, okay, well, I haven't produced anything for a while. At least on Saturdays, I could hang out with a bunch of kids and teach them some programming and not be an, a, a total failure. So I said, okay, kids, that's cool. Let's build a Lego robot, because the community center had some Lego Mindstorms robots. Who has played with Lego Mindstorms? Like, for your kids, right? I get it. So it was super cool. And those of you who have programmed with Lego Mindstorms, it's a data flow, a visual data flow language. So the programs really more or less look like this, where you have squares that you connect with wires to create a program. So at one point, the kids have gone home, and I'm looking at these programs, I'm like, hmm, I've seen this before. These programs aren't really very well structured. They suffer from some big blocks of code. They have some duplication. These are code smells in LEGO Mindstorms programs. The exact same thing that we saw accountants do in spreadsheets be very goal-driven and not very interested in the quality of their products, we saw the same thing happen to kids. They struggled with structuring their code in a really nice way. They also structured with understanding why they needed to do that. So that was interesting. Code smells. I know a thing or two about that. I could just write a tiny paper about code smells in LEGO Mindstorms programs. At least then, if I go to my tenure committee, I have something to show for, you know. I know I told you I was going to do spreadsheets, but I, I'd done some other things. So that was, that was helping me lift my spirits up. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And of course, I still have 26 minutes left, so you know I didn't stop there. Then we wanted to know, our code smells bad for kids. Does it even really matter if programs made by children have code smells? Does it really matter, maybe, for those small programs that children create? It doesn't really matter. So we did this in a, la in a language called Scratch. Who's played with Scratch? Like for your kids, right? I get it. So Scratch is a visual programming language, and as you see, it's very much designed for children. It's very colorful. This runs totally in the browser, and it's also open source. Um, and by dragging the blocks, you create programs. So it's very engaging in a live environment for children to create games in, for example. So we did a study with children programming in Scratch, and we found out that actually, Smells are bad for children. If we presented children with programs that had code smells, they performed less if they had to read and understand the programs. It's like, hmm, that's interesting. So code smells exist, and also they're not really good for young children that are just learning to program. 
So maybe two papers. Not two papers, of course. Then we wondered, are code smells common? Because I saw a bunch of code smells at the community center, but those were just a bunch of kids. At scale, if you would analyze lots of programs, would you actually find code smells? So as I already said, Scratch is open source, but they also have a repository, which is very much like Git, but then for, for like GitHub for children. You can share your programs. You can even fork programs from other children. And that entire repository is Creative Commons. So you can download all the programs and uh, print them out or uh, hang them on your wall or do some static source code analysis on them, which is what I did. So I downloaded 250,000 programs from the public repository, and I analyzed, do they actually contain code smells, or are 12-year-olds better at programming than professional developers? So the soothing news for you is the kids also make code smells. They're, they're not better at organizing their source code than we are. About 30% of the programs we found suffered from a long method smell, and about 26% of the programs suffered from a form of duplication, of repeated logic across the program, which is more or less in line with adult developers. So these code smells are harmful, but also in the outside world, they exist. Well, hmm, maybe I'm onto something. This is actually quite an interesting line of research. What we then wanted to wonder is, can we explain to children what a code smell is and how to recognize a code smell? We then created an online course that 3,000 kids took in the Netherlands in which we explained them about programming, but also about code smells, and then measured their understanding of both programming concepts and also code smell quality concepts. And the result is that actually we can teach children about code smells. They scored, on average, even a little bit higher on the questions related to code quality than on the question related to pure programming concepts. So that was good news. Smells exist. They're common. But also, we can educate children. And this was, these were children from the age of between 7 and 11. So already at a young age, you can talk to kids about code smells. So then I was like, hmm, maybe this is my new topic. I haven't done any spreadsheet work in like one and a half years. It wasn't really fun when I was still doing it. Probably this is the way forward. This is where my research is going to take me. So I had all these papers. It's like, it's time to look back. Because normally what researchers do, at least what they tell people they do, is they make a research plan and a vision, and they're executing this vision. And to a certain extent, that, that is. But here, I just fell into this research. It just happened. So I hadn't really made a plan or a strategy or a higher level vision of what I was going to do. And of course, this is where the water of programming comes back. Because even though I didn't like those spreadsheet aren't programming people, maybe I was also projecting my beliefs about programming on the children I was teaching. And going forward, taking programming education as my main goal of research, I should be aware of what values I'm imprinting upon children. Because if you're an educator, you're not just explaining what a for loop is. You're also explaining to them what programming is and why programming is useful. And I hadn't really thought of any of those things. So looking back, I had totally told children, and there might be some people in the audience that have also imprinted upon children, uh, spread, uh, programming is logical reasoning. And if you're good at logics, then you'll also be good at programming. Or maybe I said things like, programming is like problem solving. It's like a puzzle. Or maybe I said things like, you know, programming, it's really hard. And other beliefs around programming that we as a community, we have those values, whether or not we express it, this is th these are things that many people believe. Or other things are, you can teach yourself programming really well, or programming is really a good career in which you can make lots of money. These are all things that people believe as a community. And they're, they're all related. They're not individual things that people believe, these at least sort of come from the idea that what we all believe under the surface, or many people believe, is programming is like mathematics. 
programming is, is hard and logical and it's calculation, and that is giving rise to different opinions about programming. And maybe this is not the best metaphor we have for programming. And I know there's lots of metaphors for programming. Some people say programming is like cooking or programming is like gardening. But one of the metaphors that I really like and that I have explored in me going forward with my research on education is programming is like writing. And I will explain you in the remainder of this talk why I think this is such a good and valuable metaphor and how it has influenced my research. So why is programming like writing? Well, programming is you have this high-level idea, like an app that tracks compliments. I really want such an app where if someone says something nice, I'll say, can you say that again? And then I can listen to it later. It would be really nice if that existed. So ultimately, programming is you have this high-level idea, and you translate it into sentences and words. That's what programming is in an abstract way. And the same goes for writing. If you're a fiction writer, you have a weird idea like a frog murders foreign diplomats. And what you do is you take your high-level idea and you translate it into sentences and words. So you see there's lots of similarities. And for me, this metaphor is really its like coming home. It's such a nice metaphor that works in so many ways. One of the things that I like about the writing metaphor is writing is so many things. All of these things, you don't have to convince someone that these things are writing. Writing a dissertation, scientific work is writing. A petition, like participating in society is writing. A to-do list is writing, something you just write once and then throw it away with only yourself as an audience. Fiction is writing, but also calligraphy is writing. Just making nice letters because they look nice. That's writing, no one will argue. Poetry is writing bending the rules of grammar to create something beautiful or inspiring or triggering. All of these things are writing. And if you try to map these things onto the things we think are programming, many of them disappear. So science, scientific computing, it's maybe like a dissertation, that goes. A petition where you're trying to get something done. Maybe fiction where you're selling your ideas for money or sort of have brothers or nephews in programming land, but what is programming calligraphy? What is programming poetry? I actually ran a workshop a few weeks ago where I had people write poems with source code and pff, it blew their mind because it's just not a way we traditionally look at programming. So this is already the first reason that writing is such a nice metaphor. It's so very inclusive and no one will disagree that these things are all absolutely writing. But there are lots of other ways in which the langu language metaphor helps that are a bit more concrete. One of the things around language that math doesn't have, or maybe gardening, is that everyone can learn it. Everyone knows a language. Many people know two or three languages, which if you say to people programming is like language, you're like, OK, well, at least I've done it once, so probably I could learn another language. This is something that people feel quite comfortable with. If you say programming is math, that will be very detrimental, especially for minorities. Because there is this research that says the more that people believe a field has innate skills, the more people believe that you have to be born for something like math, the less females participate in the field. So if we insist upon programming as like math as our driving metaphor, maybe we're driving away girls from our field, even though we aren't saying things like, oh, you, you Sarah, you can program, it's only for Gary. These lingering beliefs also impact who feels comfortable in our field. What I also love about the language metaphor is that some stuff just makes no freaking sense. So this is me at age 16 learning English. So I'm like, I can do the English. I read a book. The teacher's like, well done. Here's another sentence for you. I'm like, I can do this. I've read a book. No, no, it's not I've read a book. It's I've read a book. Why? Creators of English, why do you do this to non-natives like me? It's ridiculous. The, la the language of Dutch has just all these two-letter things are all 
always pronounced in the same way, but not in English. And this very much correlates to some things in programming. So this is a little bit of Python. Even if you're not familiar with Python, it doesn't really matter for the example. What you see here is a for loop, which is looping over a list. And the second snippet of code is a list comprehension, which is also looping over a list. But if it's a for, then a normal for loop, it needs to end with a colon. Whereas if you do a list comprehension that also contains the keyword for, there is no colon. And you're like, yeah, sure, that's just the way it is. I had a kid in my class that said, it is unfair that they designed the language like this. You should have explained to us that the one for is not the other for. Like, imagine how it feels for children if we tell them programming is like logical reasoning. It's all logic and math. And then we present them this. You know, what a surprise that people drop out of programming courses. And especially, again, for people that might not feel very comfortable in the programming space, this could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. And also, this is Python. I mean, I could have had way more examples of things that are very, very confusing. Why is it like this? Another thing that's so great about the language metaphor is that some stuff is just cultural. It isn't logic, it's cultural. So I'm from the Netherlands. Who else is from the Netherlands? I heard a bunch of Dutch people. OK, so you get this. The Dutch, we have this very, very weird way of communicating with people that if we say, do you want to come to my house for coffee at 7 p.m., what we actually mean is, do you want to come to my house for coffee at 7 p.m.? This is. I mean, it's not confusing for me. We say what we want. But suppose you're hanging out with a French person. They'd show up at 8, and they'd be like, I am here, where's the food? We'd be like, we had food at 6, then we had coffee at 7. I don't know what you're still doing here. And this has nothing to do with language, nothing. I just expressed the words coffee and 7 p.m. Why didn't that other person understand? This exact same thing happens in programming language cultures as well. So a very simple example, of course, is if you write variables in Python, they look like this with lowercase letters and underscores. Whereas if you read a variable in C-sharp, it would be camel case. It's a small example, but this is just a thing. It's culture. There's no reason in the compiler or an interpreter why the languages are like this. It just evolved the way it evolved. And there are more interesting or maybe scary examples of this. So there's a German researcher, Lutz Prechtold, and he did a study with a bunch of students that were fluent in different programming languages. And he asked them to implement a mapping from numbers to strings. So they got a table like this, like one maps to R and S, and two to T and U, and three to F and X, and they got all the letters like this. And then they got little codes like 2213, and that would map with this encoding to the word turf. It's a simple exercise, like a, an encryp encryption type exercise. And then they had people from the Java community and the Python community do this exercise. So some people used a, a tenfold tree where every node had the letters that were associated to the nodes. 50% of the people that were Java developers did that. No one that was a Python developer did that. Python has trees. This has nothing to do with the syntax of the language. This is purely cultural. Some people created a hash map. No one that was a Java programmer used a hash map. Java has hash maps. This has nothing to do with the syntax of the language. Almost everyone in the Python, and by the way, also the Perl community, used the hash map. So the cultures of our languages very much impact the solutions that we select. And this, again, makes it so nice that the language, the language metaphor fits. It's like, yeah, some people, if they say something, they mean it exactly, and other people don't. It doesn't really necessarily fit so well with the story we tell ourselves about we are logical beings. We programmers just pick the best solution, and we are not influenced by the language that we write. It doesn't really seem to be true. 
So as I said, this metaphor has really inspired not just me giving talks like this, but also the way my research is going. Because if we say programming is like language, then maybe we should also teach programming like we teach language. And many people have studied how to teach language in great detail for a long period of time. This is a field that has existed for 60, 70 years already, really studying the details of different letters and word systems. And we can learn from that as programming. We know so many things about teaching language. And one of the things that maybe come to mind if you remember how you were learning your first language or your second language is that language class is really rich in different activities. So if you're learning a language, you'll do reading and writing, practicing words, speaking, listening to people speak the language. It's very rich in the different ways that we interact with language. And if you try to map this to programming, it's basically writing. Exercises we do in programming class is mainly writing and nothing of the other things, maybe a little bit of reading here and there. One of the big streams that you have in teaching language is there's two big flavors. One is called the phonics approach, and one is called the whole language approach. So the phonics approach, very popular in, uh, and currently it's very popular, especially in countries with languages like the Netherlands, where the letters map to the sounds directly. So phonics is very much reading letter by letter. So if you're reading the word read, you would do R, E, D, read. Practice small words, and by that build up a bigger vocabulary of words that you can write. An alternative version is called the whole language approach, where you say, no, we're not focusing on individual letters, we're more focusing on the context of writing, we give kids sentences, because language is not just technology, it's not just a technique, it also has to do with communication, so it's better if you read full sentences. And this is also one of the reasons that the whole language approach has been very popular in English-speaking languages, because of this fact that read isn't pronounceable apart from its embedding in the language. So if we look at how we teach programming, lots of programming is the whole language approach. We basically say, make a program to reverse a string. We're talking about what do we do with this program, the realistic context of programming, very much like a word is embedded in a sentence. A phonics approach would be more like t taking one keyword and just focusing on that keyword for a very long time, what is the syntax, what is the meaning, doing that for a while, and only then constructing bigger programs. In language, it's pretty clear that this phonics approach is superior over the whole language approach. Even though there's still people that do the whole language approach, lots of research is saying that phonics is the best way. And this, by the way, isn't just for language, also for math, practicing small steps, this is Dutch, I'm sorry, is a superior way of teaching over realistic bigger examples. So the direction I'm going with my research is I'm trying to explore how would a phonics approach look like for programming. If we're going to say, rather than teaching programs as a whole from the start, we're going to pick the tiniest elements, the, the, the atoms of programming, and teach children the basic building blocks of programming, and only then look at bigger programs. So one of the things, I hope my audio works, one of the things we're trying with children is actually to have them practice reading source code aloud. So we say things, like, I say things in a classroom like, repeat after me, for, I, in range, open bracket, for, closing bracket, colon, and the whole group of kids repeats the code with me to practice the syntax. And let's hope that we can actually listen to a snippet of kids in a classroom.
No, nothing. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, it was there. Try again. Okay. Nothing? Okay. Just imagine a group of kids saying, for I in range, open bracket for. So this is what we're trying to practice. And why is it important to speak the source code aloud? Because that's, of course, not the way we're going to program a computer. But R-E-D, read, also isn't the way we're going to speak natural language or even write or read natural language. Why it's important to focus on this small building block is because if you've said this one million times, it takes you no more cognitive energy, cognitive load, to remember that a range has an opening bracket and a closing bracket and a colon. You've practiced this skill so often that it takes you zero effort to write this. Very much like it takes us, normally functioning adults, zero effort to read a text. And because it's not taking us effort to read the individual letters, we can focus on what does it actually mean. So our hypothesis here is that if we practice these small building blocks, after a while it takes children no more energy, cognitive energy, to write a for loop. They're not thinking, oh, should I do a colon here? Should I do an open bracket here? And therefore they can focus on the higher level of programming. And one of the first results, this was just a tiny study with 10 children, we found that children who read code aloud better, and by better we mean more consistently, they're also the better programmers in the classroom. So this seems to indicate at least that there's a correlation between being able to read out loud and comprehending source code, even though, of course, we don't know what way the correlation goes. It could be that kids that are very precise are good at programming and also good at reading aloud. But at least there is a correlation between those two. And we give children homework, and this homework is not reverse a string. The homework here is, here are 25 assignments, Finish them, just focusing on the syntax. Practice, 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 practice how an assignment looks like. Practice how an if statement looks like. We don't go as far at this point as having them practice without also telling them the meaning. But in theory, you could do this. You could just teach kids this is an if statement. Even without explaining to them what it is, they could practice the skill of this is how it looks like. We, we do explain to them what it means. but. Practice, it's what we're doing. And of course, also in this field, there are naysayers. That this isn't real code, people didn't leave, but they are following me and they have some criticism here as well. They say, hmm, it doesn't look fun. When I was teaching myself programming on my Commodore, uh, I didn't need these approaches. I could just make games and automatically understand everything. So the fact that someone was able to learn it in that way, of course, doesn't mean that this is the best way for everyone. Research shows that it really doesn't matter. There's no correlation whatsoever between how much fun children are having and how much they are learning. In fact, often children prefer to do activities at the, the highest skill level that they have, but not higher, so they can already do all the exercises. It's up to us as educators to present children with exercises that are just above the level that they can do. And of course, I know there are lots of people, probably they're here in the room as well, that were able to learn programming in another way. But it doesn't mean it's the best way, and it doesn't mean it works for everyone. So the fact that it's not really very fun doesn't really impress me because it doesn't say anything about what children are learning. And the final thing that I like so much about this phonics approach is not just that it is a superior form of teaching, probably, it's also that if you give children little building blocks, they have way more freedom to come up with exercises. If the first thing you have children do with a for loop is reverse a string, it very much limits what we imprint upon them, what programming is for. They maybe can say, oh, well, then I can al also reverse a big number, or then I can also alphabetically sort letters. 
but they wouldn't come up with really, really weird stuff. Some kids, again, might, but lots of children say, oh, okay, apparently programming is for reversing text. I don't know why we need programming for that, but okay, if you tell me adult, it's probably what it is. So if you give them their little building blocks, they can do super weird things. So we, we were building, we were programming with a group of 12-year-olds, boys and girls, and yeah, the girls in the beginning they weren't really engaged because it's like programming, we don't really know if it's fun. And then I said, okay, you can build whatever you want. They said, you know what we want to program? Like a text adventure-like game about a narwhal. Who knows what a narwhal is? I didn't know what a narwhal was. I thought these kids are shitting me, but apparently this is an actual creature that lives in the sea. It is a dolphin. So imagine a dolphin. It's swimming, a dolphin. But it has a unicorn horn on its head. This is an actual animal that exists. So because we weren't telling them what to do with programming, they say, said, we want to make a story about a narwhal. I hadn't even heard of this animal. I didn't even know it was a thing. So clearly, this was an exercise that I could not have come up with. The only way this exercise exists is when you give kids the space to tell you what they want to build, rather than the other way around. And that's another reason that this phonics approach is so nice, because it takes away as much context as possible. So that's everything I wanted to share. Let me just recap my entire talk in about 30 seconds. So if you haven't got inspiration for a question, this is your second chance to get the gist of the talk. First of all, this is important, and I really like that many, many talks at this conference were actually about productivity and how you feel rather than just the technology. So my first piece of advice is, Listen to your heart. If you're not having fun with what you're doing, you should do something else. And I was really lucky that this whole programming for kids stuff ended up on my path because I don't know where I would have been otherwise. Secondly, think about the water of programming. It's super cool to hang out with programmers all the time, but maybe it's accidentally narrowing your view of our field. And don't be this person, please. Don't ever say to people, it's not real programming. If I hear you do it, I will find you and I will kill you. <laughs> it is not funny. Be a knitter, be a runner. If someone comes to your meetup and saying like, hello, I'm new here and I do VB6, you will say, congratulations, sir. You're welcome in this space. Don't be that people, they're stupid. <laughs> Thirdly, Programming is writing. I know there are lots of metaphors, but this writing metaphor for me is really open and inclusive and helped me shape my teaching and my research. And the way we're going is towards a phonics approach for programming. As I said, I'm really trying to find the smallest atom of what programming is to make as many people feel welcome and successful in our field. The end. I'm Felina, my website is felina.com, also where you can find previously recorded versions of this talk and the slides. I have actually, I know this will be a question. Yes, I have hand-drawn these slides with an app called GoodNotes and an Apple Pencil, which is a superior piece of technology. And special thanks to a bunch of people. I don't know if Lou is in the audience, but I know he's in the venue. He's definitely one of the people that helped me shape this line of research. Also, Kevlin, I know he's left, but also he has had great influence on my thinking and a bunch of other people that I hang, hang out with over the course of doing this research. Thank you so much, Felina. I'm super sorry I butchered your name. Let's go to questions. <laughs> All right. What are the biggest mistakes you see practicing software engineers make and how they approach teaching programming to kids? Forcing children. And I'm serious, there's lots of people that want to teach their kids programming because they really like programming. And it doesn't go from what the kid wants, it's just you should like programming. So a good way to turn that around is to ask ki your kids or the kids you're teaching what they want to build. Like, what are you excited about? Horses? Let, let's make an app that categorizes horses. So show them what programming can do for them because not everyone will share 
your love for programming, for the technology, but lots of people will like what they can do with it. All right. What about syntax differences? What language would you choose for kids? Python. It all depends on the age. So if they're really young, like elementary school age, I would definitely teach Scratch. The nice thing about Scratch is that I showed the user interface as it was in English, but you can actually localize the keywords to other languages like Dutch or Hungarian or Polish. And research has shown, unsurprisingly, that programming in your own natural language is way easier than programming in English if you're not an English kid. So younger kids Scratch and older kids, I would definitely say Python. Not, uh, not because it was invented by a Dutch person, although that's definitely a plus. Also, the syntax is very friendly, and the community is very friendly, which I think also matters in teaching something to kids. All right. We're actually super out of time, so this is it for the Q&A. Let's give another hand for Felina. Thank you so much for the amazing talk.